The Pacific Island nation of Palau has a population of about 21,000 and a GDP of around $290 million. There are blocks in Manhattan with more people, and some of the borough's residents are a lot wealthier. But Palau's 250 islands and the oceans around them cover an area the size of France, and those waters are favorite hunting grounds of illegal fishermen. In an article in the New York Times Sunday magazine called Sea Sweepers, investigative reporter Ian Urbina looks at how a nation with limited resources may protect itself and set an example for policing the world's oceans. And I'm very pleased that it has brought Ian Urbina back to our show. Hello. Hi there. Last October, Palau passed legislation to protect 80% of its maritime territory. What's prohibited prohibited under the new law? Well, most types of commercial export fishing are prohibited. Um, there's still, uh, you know, local fishermen, Palauans, can still fish those waters for domestic consumption. But uh, the big players that were exporting mostly tuna uh, now can no longer fish in those waters unless they have a license and there's only one or two um, uh, companies that do. UNESCO declared the Rock Islands of Palau a World Heritage Site in 2012. Are there species or ecosystems in and around Palau that are found nowhere else? Or we're talking about tuna, uh, tuna are all over the oceans. Yeah, so, I mean, Palau is famous for its marine diversity and quite especially for um, uh, its coral fish. Uh, there's a lot of coral life around these small atolls that make up the archipelago uh, and is the real draw for, you know, 50% of its economy is tourism, and most of that is scuba and snorkeling tourism, and folks are coming to look at um, those coral reef and the fish that live there, and then a fair number of them are coming to look at the shark population that's fairly robust in those waters as well. And Palau is doing things to protect the sharks? Yes, so Palau passed um, a a ban on shark finning, which is uh, uh, this process that you often find on tuna longliner ships where the sharks are caught um, on the same longline as the tuna. And uh, the shark meat, the carcass, the main body of the shark, is not so valuable. But the shark fin um, is used in a popular delicacy uh, in Asia, especially in China, called shark fin soup. And uh, in banning shark finning, um, uh, Palau has tried to um, cut back on the uh, sort of extinction of, of, of species in the shark population. All told, how much illegal fishing is there in Palau's waters, and how much globally is it even possible to estimate that? Yeah, I mean, you know, these are dark economies, illicit activities, always hard to quantify. Um, you hear varying numbers from globally 10 billion to 22 to 25 billion, with a B, um, globally. Um, There's some studies that estimate one in five, one in six of all fish um, that ends up on American plates uh, is illegal. Um, uh, So it's a fairly booming market. Uh, And, you know, in Palau, because they're surrounded by these countries that have both huge fishing fleets, often state-subsidized fishing fleets, Taiwan, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, China, um, and they also have some of the largest fish markets, so the consumption is huge in those regions, too. Uh, You have um, an area of the world that that has a lot of illegal fishing boats. Did you speak to any older Palauans about what they've seen change over the years? It's a good question. You know, so I spent a day between patrols. I mean, this reporting trip was meant mostly to have me go out and embed with these, this sort of David and Goliath crew of 18 uh, cops, you know, marine cops who have the impossible job of policing the waters the size of France. And in between patrols, one day I took a plane to this tiny atoll and spent the day just uh, talking with folks there and seeing what life was like. And one gentleman was um, sort of recounting back when he was young and, you know, they all fish and um, he would go out for three hours and come back with a cooler full of fish, you know, for his own family, uh, now he could stay out nine, ten hours straight, and he would have maybe two or three fish total um, if he was lucky. So is illegal fishing depriving Palau of income that it would uh, have had otherwise? And this is like one of the fundamental questions that sort of dogged me um, in the reporting 
Yes is the simple answer. Illegal fishing is a real problem, um, and a place like Palau, you know, it suffers it in multiple ways. Um, Do they want to catch these fish, or is this all about conservation, or at least somewhat about conservation? Well, it's it's about conservation. It's about their economy. It's about domestic protein source. You know, it's about food security. It's about geopolitics. Um, but I think the bigger issue, too, is that, you know, while one in five fish is illegal, four of the five are legally caught. And so this is as much a story about overfishing and sort of the consumption of Western and Asian, you know, consumers like you and me, um, as it is about illegal fishing and those boats that these police are chasing. And the real question begged is, you know, are the oceans being depleted um, only by illegal fishing, or, you know, is there a much bigger problem here with overfishing? And have scientists uh, weighed in on all of this, on on Palau's ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of science um, coming out uh, that sort of all points to the direction that, you know, it, like many places in the Pacific, are rapidly being depleted, and, you know, against the backdrop of climate change and, you know, acidification, um, a lot of these atolls are ra- rapidly disappearing. Um, so the, the stack, you know, the cards are stacked against um, these island nations. Um, but yeah, it's been well quantified that um, these waters are being uh, raked clean, and uh, some species are disappearing entirely. I'm speaking with Ian Urbina, whose article "Sea Sweepers" was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. You can find it on online under another heading: Palau versus the poachers. This is WNYC, WNYC dot org. I'm Leonard Lopate. Aren't there different kinds of maritime territory? There's territorial waters, contiguous zones, exclusive economic zones. Which ones is are Palau trying to protect? Right. Yeah, it's complicated. So, um, twelve miles from shore constitute national waters. Two hundred miles from shore, that whole space constitute uh, exclusive economic zone. The difference is 12 miles from shore, that country has full rights over everything. Um, Beyond the 12 mile mark up to the 200 mark, that country has rights over mining and fishing. And the region that Palau is attempting to govern and police in some ways better than virtually any other country on the planet right now, or at least more aggressively, uh, is its econ- its 200 mile zone, and the reason Plow is such an interesting story is that, like you said, in terms of land, it's a very small place. You know, the size of Philadelphia, maybe. Um, in terms of water, it's you know uh, larger than France, and they have just one patrol boat, and they're trying to keep track of those waters. And the reason for that is it's an archipelago nation, and its little islands are spread out, and each little island is a plot of the country, and it has a 200-mile zone around it. And so when you add it all up, it's a lot of water to police. But despite that, uh, it's still a tiny fraction of the Pacific. Why, why should the rest of the world even take note? Well, I mean, so the lessons learned there may be valuable for the rest of us. You know, so uh, whether Palau succeeds and where its challenges are might teach us how to better police, you know, the waters off of Hawaii or um, other places in the world, point one, point two, you know, we're all connected, right? So um, these fish that we all um, uh, live off of, um, you know, are being depleted there in much the same way and by much the same players um, as the waters off the U.S. coast. And so, you know, uh, whether Palau can actually arrest and prosecute and stop these poachers um, is a is a lesson for whether we should be doing the same near near to us. Well, the United States has a lot of islands also, so that means that our territory uh, extends far beyond our borders. What happens when uh, two countries are within the same territory? I'm thinking of Alaska and then, uh, what is it, Siberia? That's mm-hmm. uh, within 200 miles. Yeah, so th- in those situations, then the territory, the waters, there's no high, there's no high seas, there's no international water, there's just national water abutting other national water, and they're split down the middle. And there's a lot of places on the globe where there is no international waters. It's just um, one country's waters up until a certain latitude or longitude, and then the other country's waters begin, and there's no actual international waters in between. 
Are any countries lobbying for more access to the world's oceans or any big nations pressing smaller ones that have lots of marine territory? No, so Ch- the, the Asian countries are, are big um, uh, uh, consumers of fish and um, they have large fleets and they tend to be the ones that um, most resist uh, new uh, restrictions being put uh, on the big fisheries, you know, the tuna fishery in the Indian Ocean, for example. And so whenever um, other countries uh, that um, maybe have less to lose um, push for restrictions on how many fish can be pulled from the water or how many devices can be put in the water, um, those are typically the countries that uh, push back, and those are some powerful countries. Hasn't China been piling sand on reefs in the, the South China Sea and claiming them as islands? have in, in, in many ways that's less a fishing story than a geopolitical and, and um, a ga- oil and gas story really I mean that's a geopolitical play it's the Spratly Islands and uh, that is a play by the Chinese to lay claim to a contested territory by actually building an island there and having an airstrip and putting troops there and if they can legitimately pull that off then uh, they will then be able to um, uh, mine and drill those waters, which are rich in natural resources. Can't fishing fleets work on the ocean, the open oceans, free of any oversight or regulation? Why do they want to uh, to go to the areas uh, surrounding Palau? The fish you know, you swim know, all over the place, don't they? They do. I mean, to some degree, yeah. They don't swim, you know, everywhere on the globe. You know, fish, you know, are attracted to certain areas, and some areas of the planet are richer than others of certain types of fish. And the Pacific waters, the Western Pacific waters, are very rich in tuna, and so they're very attractive. And they're also just really sprawling, and there's more high seas territory and less governance there, and um, therefore they can um, more effectively um, uh, reach their catch quotas. And they're also, you know, you got to think about the economics here, right? You know, if you're you're looking at fuel as your, your biggest cost, and so you're not looking to... Uh, If you can avoid it, fish off the coast of Africa. If you can fish off the coast of Palau um, when your market is uh, right there in the Philippines or in Taiwan because it's a much shorter trip for you and uh, fuel is your biggest expense. So a lot of the illegal fishers in Palau, for example, are searching for sea cucumbers, which is another delicacy, and there are lots of those in Palau's waters, and um, that's a viable uh, trip for it's about 1,400 nautical miles. That's a viable trip for a small ship to go from Taiwan to, to Palau's waters and back, um, and then they can sell those that catch and actually make some money. Palau was also one of the first countries to ban bottom trawling. Are the, uh, the, the illegal fishermen still doing bottom trawling in its territories? Not officially. You know, um, th- there is some, I'm told, uh, and um, but this is sort of why this policing story was so, at least to me, important. Um, because uh, laws are only as good as their enforcement, and um, you know whether they can um, actually stop these trawlers will depend on whether they have effective and sufficient police forces. And right now they have, to some degree, they have it, and in other ways they really don't. So there is trawling still going on, but it's all illegal, and, and um, whenever they can catch those, those guys, they, they try to prosecute them. Ten years ago, Science Magazine reported that all the world's fisheries could collapse by 2048. Um, was that the, the, the 2060, 20, 2006 ban that uh, Palau had on bottom trawling um, the first time that they had made any kind of fishing illegal? Was it in response to what scientists were saying? I don't think it was in response to what scientists were saying. I think it was more in response to what locally they were seeing, you know, like the guy with the cooler I described earlier. You know, they had been seeing in Palau for a while a steady decline in their own catches, and that worried them. And there's a long sort of tribal and cultural tradition in Palau of the bull, which is sort of a tribal way of calling a a moratorium on fishing whenever things got thin. Uh, So they initiated another one to try to help... um, uh, give the fish stocks a chance to regrow. Um, the problem is that, you know, the fishing industry, as you point out, um, has become super industrialized, super efficient, and technology has really um, helped uh, fishing, uh, you know, kind of move from uh, hunting to harvesting, and, and you no longer have to look for them. You just have to go get them uh, because of technology. And so um, uh, even though there was a bowl, even though there's a moratorium, 
you know, the, the ships are just really, really efficient at um, striking, grabbing what they need, and getting out. Um, and that's why this is a, a, a tougher problem now than it has been any time in history. Is this new law, the one uh, that was enacted in October, supposed to make up for what past laws missed, or is it taking past legislation to the next logical step? I think I mean, that's a good intuition. I, th I think that last um, description is right. I think um, these other prior laws were partial, you know, um, uh, but I think they're realizing that um, they need a bigger fix, and so by creating a no-take zone, um, it's meant to just um, shut everything down um, and see if that works. Um, the depressing part here is, as you pointed out before, fish don't really pay attention to borders, you know, and so they, um, even if you create a asylum area around your country, if just beyond your safe zone border there are 50,000, you know, devices and ships out there that are scooping the fish up before they can even get to your safe zone, then you have a much bigger problem, uh, and your safe zone isn't going to do much good. And that, unfortunately, is the reality right now. The, the amount of space on the world's waters that are protected like that is around 2 3%, and most scientists say you'd have to be up to 10% or 12% before you could actually see true regaining of fish stocks to the level that that's needed. And so hopefully Palau will be setting an example, but uh, we have some ways to go before other countries follow that example. And Palau, as we mentioned earlier, has a population of 21,000, so it can't uh, send that many people out there to enforce these laws. We'll take a little break, and when we come back, we'll talk about some of the recent incidents. Uh, my guest is Ian Urbina, whose article, Sea Sweepers, was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. We have a link to it on our show page at WNYC.org. You can also find it online from the New York Times on Palau versus the Poachers. Stay with us for more. And we are back with Ian Urbina, whose article, Sea Sweepers, was in the Sunday New York Times Magazine, also available online as Palau versus the Poachers at, w at uh, NewYorkTimes.com. And you can find to a, a link to it on our show page at WNYC.org slash Lopate. Ian, you describe a, a chase to stop a Taiwanese pirate ship. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is a chase that unfolded um, in January 2015. Um, and it was illustrative, I think, of the sorts of collaboration that probably will have to exist for um, other countries to tackle this um, in essence, there was um, a illegal uh, poacher vessel, uh, Taiwanese tuna longliner, um, that uh, had been spotted previously in Palau's waters. It showed up again uh, and in pretty far. Um, in this instance, Palau was working with this organization that does great work called Sky Truth, um, this satellite um, monitoring group based in West Virginia, of all places. Um, and uh, Sky Truth uh, saw these these pirates uh, enter the waters again, alerted the Palauans. The Palauans sort of mobilized their crew and w went after them. And this is a you know slow, huge, slow process over a huge space, and so it takes a while to get to the right coordinates. And in the meantime, this ship uh, had um, made a ran run for it and was trying to get out of Palau's waters and back into in Indonesian waters where the Palauans don't have jurisdiction. And Were you and on board for the chase? I was not. I was uh -huh. not. I was not. Um, what kind so, of haul did the, were the poachers taking? So these were, uh, this was a tuna ship. They were, they were taking tuna, but when they finally caught these guys and brought them back to shore, they realized they were taking more than tuna. They, they had been um, really aggressively shark finning, and they had um, hundreds upon hundreds of shark fin fins, um, severed shark fins in the hull um, of the ship, uh, which are all illegal. And, um, and so these guys were prosecuted, and the ship was uh, banned from the waters. Uh, Sky Truth the, is a nonprofit, and the Pew Charitable Trusts have also been involved in doing this kind of work. Uh, the, the, one of the men you write about is a man named Bjorn Bergman, who's in West Virginia. What are they doing that governments or for-profits aren't or won't or can't do? Mm -hmm. So um, what Sky Truth and the likes of Bjorn, funded by the likes of Pew, 
we're doing um, is m using satellite information uh, and technology to watch big spaces on the sea, um, either for oil spills or for trafficking of various sorts, and in this case, for illegal fishing. Um, and country, you know, the thought here is in the age of big data and drones and satellites, um, why can't we use um, high tech to better police these huge spaces, especially on behalf of small countries like Palau that don't have the money or the manpower to um, have planes flying over them and ships patrolling them. And this story was sort of, this one anecdote was an, was an example of what that might look like. And more companies uh, and NGOs are getting involved. Oceana, um, one NGO, has teamed up with Google and uh, are, are doing similar sort of monitoring work, and Q is working with uh, some British uh, satellite firm. So m more players are getting in the mix to try to mobilize uh, satellites to watch these spaces. Satellite imagery uh, is is one of the main sources here. Uh, but for drones or satellites to be effective, doesn't it need constant updating and analysis? How can Palauan law enforcement follow up on high-tech monitoring of lawbreakers? Yeah, so, I mean, there are two answers there. One is um, yes. Uh, it, it, you know, it, you can't do it just with the technology. You need people who are using the technology and processing the information, and and that's where interesting collaborations can come in that are global. You know, so because you don't need to be sitting in Palau to be looking at the data coming uh, from the satellites. But at the end of the day, you still need to send a ship out to get the bad guys, right? And that's where um, you know things are still very costly and difficult for these small Pacific Island nations, uh, and that's where sort of Western interested parties um, are probably going to have to get involved and help. Now, are are there also innovations that are allowing poachers and pirates to evade capture? Yeah, I mean, the history of uh, the last 50, 60 years is one of um, this uh, industry going from more art than science to, you know, high science, you know, and, and so now uh, you have these mega trawlers and super ships with um, amazing technology and um, uh, super strong nets that can stretch across a mile and, you know, do um, things that 10 years ago they couldn't. Um, so their overall catches are, you know, way higher, and, and that means that technology is as much the adversary here as it is the asset. I'm speaking with Ian Urbina, whose article Sea Sweepers is in the Sunday Times magazine. You can find a link to it on our show page at WNYC.org. We've heard a lot about high-tech law enforcement to combat alleged terrorism, but do you know whether the United States or other advanced industrial countries are taking such measures to protect the environment? Yeah, I mean, beyond, I, I think I think this is one example. I mean, so the U.S. Um, has played a role. Uh, um, the U.S. military, the U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard uh, have, have been helping uh, Palau and um, both from a technological point of view and um, granting access to some of this information and hardware. So, for example, in Palau, there's an interesting old world, new world collaboration where the U.S. military and the Australian military have provided equipment that historically was used in Afghanistan and Iraq to spot IEDs on roads, you know, from uh, either from airplanes or higher up. Um, so really, really refined cameras that can sense metal in in small spaces on the road. And that same equipment is now being put on the bottom of these little Cessna planes that are used by missionaries in Palau. And these missionaries historically would go out to the little atolls and deliver medicine and food and the Word of God. And now these same groups, these same missionaries on their little planes, have this high-tech equipment that was used for warfare on the bottom of them, and it's being used uh, to look for illegal boats uh, in the waters that they're flying over. Don't the seas around Palau and everywhere face a number of environmental threats besides poaching and overfishing? How might sea level rise affect uh, Palau and its various islands? So, yeah, I mean, that's where it gets bleak fast. And then you we know. have climate change affecting fisheries. Yeah, I mean, you know, so as much as the problem here is focused on the bad actors, then you have the backdrop of these huge forces, climate change, and it comes in various forms, right? You have 
sea level rise, you have um, sea temperature rise, and you have ocean acidification, and you have super cyclones, and all of those things are hitting these island nations especially hard. So in Palau's case, you know, you have these mega cyclones that have, you know, um, one several years ago destroyed nearly 40 percent of the coral reefs around uh, some of these islands and devastated the fish that live there. Um, but at the same time, you have um, the sea level rise causing some of these atolls to disappear. And so in Palau, for example, you have one atoll that's it's the country's southernmost marker, and it is rapidly disappearing, this atoll. And when it goes, Palau will lose on the order, I'm forgetting the number, but something like 50,000 square miles of its country, of its real estate that makes up its you know, waters, because that southernmost atoll will no longer exist, and so its southernmost border will have to come northward, and that means Indonesia gets the added advantage of those extra waters. So this is sort of an existential fight, you know, for places like Palau. And then you mentioned that by 2050, the sea could contain more plastic waste than fish. Is that a concern in Palau? I think it's a concern everywhere. I mean, that is one study, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really striking factoid, um, and it speaks to, you know, two factors, right? It speaks to um, the rate at which trash and plastic, non-biodegradable trash is ending up in the sea on the one hand, and the rate at which the seas are disappearing of their fish on the other hand. And so I think that is, um, that's certainly a concern for Palau, but that's really a global uh, worry. Now, what happens when they catch uh, illegal fishers? Um, can they arrest them? Yeah, this is when you get down into the weeds, and, it, and it's really kind of where, to my mind, it gets interesting and complicated. So even when you catch a ship, right, in Palau, um, that's hard enough as it is. And then you catch them and you bring them back into port. Well, in some cases, the question became, okay, what do we do with these guys? This is a ship full of 20 people, and what do we do with the ship? And we need to treat them humanely. And so they had to put them, you know, they don't have a jail that's big enough to hold all of them, so they put them for a while in a hotel. Um, and then they have to figure out, can they prosecute them? Do they even have the laws? Do they have the evidence that in their own laws would work to prosecute them? Do they, you know, um, can they use satellite data to, to prove that these guys were doing something illegal, or is that not really going to work in their own courts? Um, do they have the budget to fly these guys home? Um, or should they send them back in their ship? If they send them back in their ship, there's a decent chance those guys will show back up again, you know, months later, illegally fishing again. So Palau and other countries like Indonesia have opted to burn some of these ships, but then they have to pay to fly the guys home. Um, and that's a lot of money for, for a country that has a very small budget. Um, so these sort of um, logistical challenges are very real, and that's where you get back to the point of, you know, if the world cares about the oceans generally, um, the wealthier nations are probably going to have to step up and start sort of helping uh, these small Pacific nations, you know, these island nations, uh, fight these battles. The crew members on one fishing vessel were fined $1,000 each. That couldn't be very much of a burden. Um, but you quote a Palawan officer who refers to the fishermen by saying they're the real bycatch. What did he mean by that? Yeah, I mean, you know, so one of the things we did do is board some of these ships, and, and it's a pretty depressing line of work and pretty um, harsh conditions and dangerous and, and dirty. And, um, and you know, the, the crew, the deckhand on these ships do, are not the ones that really make any money. These are typically um, developing world, uh, very poor, often illiterate, don't speak the language of their captain, have no idea whose waters they're in anyway, and they don't make the decisions of where they go and what they do. They just are there for the job. Um, and, you know, they're the ones that often get netted, you know, metaphorically uh, in these um, law enforcement actions and end up serving um, jail sentences until they're sent back. Uh, in some cases, they're not sent back um, in some cases. Um, so, uh, you know, th I think what that officer was saying was, you know, the uh, the depressing part here is that, you know, they're they're going after these um, deckhands and these small boat captains, but the ones who are really making the decisions and the ones who are really profiting from this illegality are on land and far out of reach. In one case, a Chinese fisherman was shot. What happened there, and how did the Chinese government react? So this was a case where, uh, again, an illegal fishing boat, it was, again, a Taiwanese tuna longliner, had uh, invaded the waters back in 2012 of Palau, and this was early 
you know, when Palau was still trying to figure out how to do this. And um, this ship had been spotted um, several times, and local rangers on one of these small islands went after it. They got away. They went after it again on another day. They got away. And on the third time, uh, they the officers attempted to shoot the engine out to try to uh, debilitate the fleeing um, fast boat. And um, uh, the bullets uh, ricocheted off the engine and um, killed one of the Chinese deckhands. Uh, and it became this real big international row, and China sent a diplomatic mission over to talk about um, that killing and uh, threatened sanctions. And it was very embarrassing and frustrating for Palau, because on the one hand, they were legitimately trying to police their waters, but on the other hand, they didn't mean to um, cause someone to die. The U.S. has the world's largest zone, over 4.5 million square miles, compared to Palau's 193,000. Is the U.S. doing anything to protect its waters? And um, in light of uh, the Obama administration's adding of 400,000 square miles to reserves in American waters, are we seeing uh, this becoming a political issue in the United States? It is. I mean, you know, th these issues are very different in U.S. waters. The U.S. waters are fairly well policed. Um, illegal fishing does not happen as often. Um, uh, we have a very robust Coast Guard, um, and we have a lot of, for, for post-9-11 terrorism reasons as much as any others, you know, a lot of command control of our space. Um, so th these are not as acute um, a problem here in our waters. But in, in our waters, it's American fishermen who sometimes break the law. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a different sort of problem there where it's domestic um, fishermen who feel a certain right to fish um, like they always have and, and really resent these quotas and environmental laws being placed on them. And so they take um, what they think is um, fair, and, and, and often that's beyond what they're supposed to take. And and, you know, different states um, are more aggressive um, in uh, policing that. Ian Arbina's article, Sea Sweepers, was in the Sunday New York Times magazine. You can find a link to it on our show page at wnyc.org slash Thank you so much for being on our show again. Thank you for having me.